Hey everybody, so I'm going to show you around our permaculture property here in Winnipeg, Manitoba. That's uh, USDA Zone 3. So, and hopefully this will help you give some design ideas for yourself or explain why this beautiful chaos in front of you is applied common sense. So, let's start with the water systems. I'm just going to walk on through here. So one of the problems with urban design is that all of the water, it comes onto these hard surfaces like roofs and driveways and streets, and it's immediately sent down into the sewer system as fast as possible. Then into the rivers and it's gone. And actually what we're doing there is we're breaking the water cycle. Uh, the water is meant to soak into the soil and then be transpirated through the plants back up into the sky where it forms clouds and then it rains again. So if we don't participate in that cycle, then we get less rain, which leads you to the drought conditions that we're currently having for the third year in a row here in Manitoba and many other parts of the world. So what we have here is instead um, the water comes down off the roof into these rain barrels here. These rain barrels both fill passively from the gravity. You can see the pipe there on the back that once the barrels are full it overflows then down into this pipe here, which then goes underneath the ground and emerges into this wood chip trail. And that's an interesting feature in our garden here, our yarden you might say, is that these wood chip trails are actually trenches that we dug. Uh, we dug them about two feet deep. I wouldn't go that deep again if I was going to do it. Then we took scrap wood and we built a, like a boardwalk over top and then we put wood chip mulch over top of that. So these are actually, well, think of it like a uh, water retention reservoir. So the water comes off the roof into those barrels. Once the barrels are full, it overflows into here and then it saturates out into the entire yard, the entire property, uh, where we can store it in the soil. So we don't have thousands of liters of water storage as many thousands of liters of water storage as we would like in our rain barrels, but we can store thousands and thousands of liters of water in our soil here. So the beautiful thing about that too is that the fungi that all live in those wood chips and everything else that is in there all uh, will soak up that soil or soak up that water and bring it up to the plants where it'll exchange it for nutrients and sugars with the plants. And so we essentially have a uh, passive watering system. So this isn't to say that through these extreme drought conditions that we're having right now, it hasn't rained in over a month. And like I said, it's been dry for the past two summers before this as well. We didn't even have very much snow this winter. But we do retain each and every drop of water that does come onto the property in those situations, which leaves us a lot more resilient. We can go for weeks without watering, um, without rain. So even onto our boulevard here, you can see that we have an existing uh, beautiful ash tree, which we're hoping will survive the emerald ash borers, but uh, we will see. Uh, but either which way, there's a grapevine growing up there, and that has got about 50 bunches of grapes on it this year, which we're happy to see that it's finally taken off. It's been about uh, eight years that that's been in place. Uh, we've got a variety of plants that are happy for the pollinators here, and we have some that, like this comfrey that we chop and then spread around as a mulch and a fertilizer. Some of these plants we planted, some of them just showed up and we call those volunteers rather than weeds. Uh, many of them are native, not all of them are. Uh, there's a monarch that's been fluttering around here. Some of these are food plants, uh, like the garlic, the uh, garlic chives, there's strawberries interspersed. There's a Nanking cherry bush over there, past my uh, collection of pallets. <laughs> There's uh, also a variety of wild onions. There's herbal uh, medicine plants, such as the wild sage. Um, the uh, bee balm is also a nice edible or medicinal. It has a taste just like oregano. Uh, and again, the bees love it. You know, so we try and incorporate as many things with multiple purposes, just like those pathways have more than one purpose. They're not just for access. They're also for, uh, to encourage biodiversity and they serve as a water retention system. Uh, one thing I should mention about that water retention system is that if you uh, design something like that, you of course don't want to be flooding your own house. So what you need to do is ensure that uh, you know, the water flows away from your house, first of all, 
Uh, but then also, if this was all still a ditch, there's a, uh, a check dam, you would call it, uh, but it's like a little hump uh, in the ditch, uh, like a, a dam, a block, to, so that all the water flows in and stays. But then the top of that dam, where the water would flow over in an extreme uh, rainfall event, uh, is lower than all the rest of the system. So should the system completely fill with water, then it'll actually trickle out here, out onto the sidewalk, where we then again have, through these bricks by the sidewalk, another little ditch that it can then fill and overflow and then come out to the boulevard where there is yet again the same thing. So that's one pattern that you'll see throughout, is that uh, the water will flow through a series of systems like that. Here's a nice plant, uh, Anis hyssop, a uh, beautiful licorice taste that's really nice as tea. Uh, there's some sea holly, which is also an edible. There's some sea buckthorn, which is a nitrogen fixer and gives off uh, superfood berries. This is plum tree that we've had a lot of trouble getting fruit off of, but we're still working on it. And here at the front door, we're actually going to be installing some raspberries. Uh, and from this little space here, judging by our success over on the other side of the house, which I'll show you in a second, uh, we would expect about a four liter ice cream pail full of raspberries in the course of the season from this little space here just in front of the window. Um, just at the back part of that space there in front of the window. And one thing worth mentioning is that this overhang on the house here, we're facing, um, this is the south facing side of the house right now. Uh, it's the morning in the middle of July here. Uh, this overhang, uh, as the sun gets higher in the sky in the course of the summer, uh, the sun then no longer comes in the front window, and so we don't have to fight it with the air conditioning. But that overhang is uh, also short enough that in the winter, when the sun is lower, we do get the sun coming in, and then it passively heats the house. And simple design considerations like that have not been uh, incorporated into our culture. Uh, we think we're very smart, but uh, there's some very basic considerations that we have not been taken into effect commonly. So this vine in the uh, arbor here is actually a kiwi. So yes, in zone three, you know, uh, minus 40 Celsius or, or Fahrenheit, uh, Winnipeg, we can grow kiwis. Here, I'll try and get a nice shot of some of these here. Uh, we're having a really good crop this year. You need to put a male on one side and a female on the other. Uh, they don't have any hair on them. They're about the size of grapes, and yes, they, they are exactly like the kiwis from the store. They taste wonderful. So, that trailer full of wood out there, out front, that you saw, that's uh, all wood that I've harvested here uh, within the city, uh, diverting it from the waste stream. And we use that for heating, which you'll see here in a second. So here's one of our sour cherry trees that we planted, and we really pushed it with... Uh, it would prefer much more sun this, uh, than this, so it grew quite tall, but and it took longer to start producing, but now we are starting to have a beautiful crop of cherries. And again, there's some hascap bushes here. There's some mint. All kinds of raspberries, more comfrey. And you'll notice that everything is mulched. And before we go on to that, here is our second cherry tree, second sour cherry tree. Um, and we'll get about 15 pounds of cherries off of this tree. And so these are sour cherries. We can't grow sweet cherries here in the cold hell of Manitoba. But uh, we can grow some beautiful cherries. So... As I was mentioning about the mulch, in the perennial beds, the plants that come back year after year, we use wood mulch. And in the annual beds, such as this green bed here, which we just added this spring, we use straw mulch, which we can purchase. And it's pre-shredded. It works wonderfully, and it feeds the soil. We have a little cucamelon growing up the side of our woodshed here. So this woodshed holds uh, three cords of wood total. Again, as I said, this has all been uh, harvested out of the waste stream here uh, within the city. And that's not enough to heat our home in the winter. It is enough to heat our home in the spring and the fall, uh, independent of the conventional furnace. But uh, it's also enough to have one nice fire every evening and get the damp out of the basement and have that enjoyment of that deep bone heat. 
So this is a garden shed that my wife and dad built two years ago now. They built the woodshed as well. I was working on my thesis at that time. Uh, we installed the patio ourselves. This is all reclaimed brick. And this patio, uh, I, one thing I should mention is that uh, we intentionally created these flowing designs in the bricks. Uh, it's, I find it much more relaxing, much more organic kind of feel. Uh, as though there's flowing water moving through the space. Uh, it's more relaxing to the eye. And this isn't just a patio, it's actually a water harvesting surface. So we intentionally uh, left it with a uh, depth of sand underneath so that it, the water would be able to infiltrate easily. Uh, and again, the water is angling away from the house and then down towards this trail where it will then input the water into this irrigation system back here. So we have a series of those same ditch trails. Um, you would call them a swale if they were on contour, but because it's flat here, we'll just call them our ditch trails. And something that we even did was we took um, King Strafaria mushrooms and inoculated them into the wood chips. So then the trail is not only an access way, a water storage mechanism, and a biodiversity enhancer, a passive watering system with a fungi, but it's actually producing edible fungi for us yet too. So if we can stack these functions like this, we can get a lot happening on this little 50 by 100 urban lot. So let me show you through the trail system here. There's all these raspberries, a huge abundance. An apple tree guild next to us here. I'll explain what that is in a second. So, the, again, the water comes off the roof, and back here we have our 1,300 liter each uh, storage totes. These are uh, extra oversized ones I just upgraded to last year. And this could be done more nicely, but uh, I went for the 80 20 rule on this one, which is 20% uh, effort for 80% results. So uh, each one holds 1,300 liters and it fills from the top off the roof. The top one fills and then it goes down and then the bottom one fills and then that overflows and comes out through a pipe here. Again, that same PVC pipe idea buried in the ground into the trail system and then out into the whole garden. We have all manner of plants everywhere, including this apple tree, um, which is now 10 years old since we planted it. It's got the comfrey underneath, which has been chopped and spread around as a fertilizer and a mulch. There's Canada violets, which are native. They're nice uh, edible green. Uh, it's got rhubarb underneath, and that's a really good pattern that I would suggest others uh, implement, uh, because the rhubarb um, not only produces food, but it actually, uh, if the apples fall off the tree, uh, it catches them, like a big catcher's mitt, and then uh, they don't have a bruise at all on them, so it's wonderful. You can pick the apples up uh, even days later, and they haven't started to rot on the ground. Uh, the rhubarb has also been harvested quite heavily. It's usually a lot more full in here. There's a currant under there as well. There's some mint and strawberries, bergamot, and many other things. Um, there's also these uh, ferns back here in the shade bed. These are uh, native fiddlehead ferns, so that's uh, a good few meals uh, worth of that that we get out of here in the spring. Uh, and this area continues to evolve. We bought this property 10 years ago, and uh, it continues to develop a little bit more every year. So this is the annual garden here. We've just installed these raised beds. Um, the trail system was the same design, but we've just changed each garden bed into a raised bed within these last two years. And one thing that I really like about this design is, again, that multiple functions. Uh, with the... Uh, border on the top, uh, it's also seating. So we can have a potluck back here, and then suddenly these turn into beautiful little seating arrangements where everyone can be facing each other with the beautiful garden around them while eating. The larger circular space here, again, serving as seating. So underneath the sunroom there, we're planning to add another greens bed because uh, we were so impressed with this first one that we installed over in this corner earlier this spring. And again, that'll be seeding along that edge. So it can be functional, it can be beautiful. 
And let's just take a peek into the back lane here. So this is our community raspberry patch where anybody that wants to is welcome to come eat these. Um, you can see again we're collecting the rainwater off of uh, not only the woodshed and the garden shed, but we got permission off of our neighbor to install a uh, small gutter and uh, downspout off of their shed as well. So we have those three barrels there. And each of the barrels are hooked up with hoses, and each of those hoses has an on-off valve uh, at the end, so we can use them for watering, uh, and that saves a lot of time. I do have some drip irrigation that I started installing last year. Uh, eventually, we're going to have that over the whole property with timers, so as long as there's water in the tanks, then uh, we'll be good to go uh, on the watering issue, and that'll be a complete huge time saver. Uh, and even if the water, the rainwater does run out, then we can simply use the hose to fill up the tanks uh, and then take advantage of the uh, gravity-fed system that way uh, while allowing the chlorine to evaporate to a degree out of the water. The water will warm up. And you noticed sort of the pink color on the inside of those barrels or the large storage totes in the background there. Uh, that allows um, the, all the uh, ecosystem inside the barrel starts growing there, the biofilm and it actually filters the water and pulls out uh, toxicity and kind of brings it back to life again. Uh, you can see there's all kinds of Saskatoons here growing in our little strip in the back lane um, and other various useful plants, um, both edible and medicinal. There's a nice wild rose here. Uh, there's grapes growing along the fence. Uh, we've talked about perhaps taking all of this out and just putting in parsnips. Uh, the, as a root crop and just in this small space here, you know, like let's say, you know, two feet by 30 uh, There would be something like uh, I would guess 20 to 40 pounds of parsnips that we can pull out of that space We grew a lot of squash there the first few years some potatoes But just something like this uh, with the raspberries. I really hope to inspire uh, others to follow suit. Uh, there's so many spaces um, Just you know down the back lane here that uh, they're just uh, growing to volunteers, which is good. There's some yarrow growing here and uh, other plants that the pollinators are enjoying. But at the same point, uh, why not just throw in some raspberries that are essentially no maintenance, especially if you're gonna uh, mow or spray any herbicides and other toxic issues like that. Why not get uh, a bucket full of raspberries instead? And uh, if you don't want them, someone else does, then that someone else might be a bird or insect. So here's my wife, she's uh, throwing some stuff in the compost bin there. Uh, we're uh, planning on going from a, a more conventional compost system like that to vermicomposting. We're just building up our uh, population of worms right now, but that'll allow us to process our compost throughout the winter and um, use a lot less space for it. So then once that uh, compost space back here is no longer needed, we will uh, be able to put a small sauna in there. Uh, perhaps even with a sunroom on it so that we can use a wood stove inside there to uh, heat up that sunroom and lay in a hammock in February in Winnipeg and get a suntan. That sounds pretty good to me. Uh, we may be able to use it as a, like a guest cabin or even a, a summer kitchen as well. We'll see. Again, those multiple functions. Uh, and we're gonna try and extend our seasons with that, uh, this is what the hoops over the raised beds are all about. So we can use it, uh, as you can see right now, uh, simply to put like uh, pest deterrents, like uh, shade cloth to keep out uh, flea beetles off of the cruciferous vegetables or whatever it might be, birds, squirrels, uh, off the tomatoes. Uh, but there's a rolled up plastic at the top of them as well, which then can come down uh, in the event of hail, um, which is becoming more frequent as well, I'm suspecting, as the climate continues to change. Uh, and uh, it'll extend our season in both the sp spring and the fall. So, oh, there goes that monarch, happily uh, laying some eggs on the milkweed around here. Yeah, and so, as you're designing your system, you probably want to work first with the uh, water. Uh, that being your first uh, design concern, and then the access pathways, and give yourself more space than you think you need. Uh, and then the uh, ways that you'll use that area is based on the way it's being divided up like that, and then taking it from there. 
and then finally choosing which plants you're going to install. There's the chimney on our wood stove. Um, and here we've uh, again pushed it uh, really with the amount of sun with these grapes, but these are white seedless grapes and they finally took off this year. We planted them I think five to eight years ago and we're going to get our first crop of just a few bunches this year, but I suspect it will continue to exponentially increase from there. I'm very much looking forward to tasting that. And again, uh, this side of the house here, just between our house and the neighbor's driveway, is again just a couple of feet here. Um, and it used to just be some lawn that needed to be maintained. And instead now we have a bounty of biodiversity. Uh, there's uh, actually a really good area with the white light. Uh, this is the uh, east side of the house. Uh, with the um, white lights bouncing the uh, light back and forth between our house and the neighbor's house uh, and the heat sink of the cement. This is actually the earliest place where everything comes up in the spring. The garlic uh, grows really well here. It's a horseradish plant, another edible perennial. We like to use the leaves to wrap fish in and bake them like that or uh, the root of course as the condiment. The young leaves in the spring are pretty decent as a, just a pot green too. Some daylilies, again, those are edible. Uh, and some raspberries. These are the royal purple variety. They're the same ones in a similar system to this that we're going to put in under the window there. Uh, and you can see uh, we have had to add in a few more plants as they've died off, uh, which this variety tends to do, but they're growing back in. And once they do, man, do they take off. So we got uh, our Nanking cherry bush here. And that about completes our tour of an urban permaculture lot in Winnipeg, Manitoba. One thing I will add is that keep in mind this is just the exterior of the property. Uh, you know, our composting system, uh, if the city would allow us to install it, if that was legal, a grey water system, all of this would be included, of course, where we buy our food from the local farmers in an actual permaculture system. It's not simply farming, it's a, it's a way of thinking uh, so that you can make appropriate design choices in providing for your needs and participating in your ecosystem. Uh, one thing I will say too is that uh, Winnipeg is currently having a crisis uh, trying to find the finances to replace its uh, aging sewer system where all of that water that I mentioned at the start of the video uh, drains down immediately into the sewers Whereas our home with this design does not contribute to that. All of the water stays on the property. So we would be able to uh, have a far less expensive sewer system in our city if others would uh, install similar options. I know in Vancouver they offer a discount. A discount on your taxes if you uh, install a system such as this that actually absorbs the rainwater rather than contributing it to the runoff. Something to keep in mind.